Bonjour, c'est un plaisir d'accueillir aujourd'hui Nathalie Palanque de la Brouille du département de physique des particules du CEA pour le séminaire de l'Institut d'astrophysique de Paris. After graduating from Telecom Paris in 92, Nathalie became a teaching assistant at the University of Chicago from where she got a master degree in physics. In 97, she completed her PhD between the University of Chicago and Paris 7 under the supervision of Eric Aubourg, François Vannucci, and Dave Schramm. At the time, she was mostly interested in Eros and Machos, and she was tracking galactic dark matter with microlensing. She joined CEA in 97, and she has been a research director since 2014. Her interest in cosmology circles around dark matter and dark energy, and she has been involved in many experiments and collaborations, such as EROS, Antares, uh, SDSS, SNLS, and DESI, for which she is now the spokeswoman. She spent many years in the US, and she has strong bonds with the University of Chicago and Berkeley University. Her research has been awarded with many prizes, such as the Prix Saint-Gobain de la Société Française de Physique et le prix Irène Joliot-Curie. She was elected at the French Academy of Science recently in 2020. Besides, Nathalie has been involved in popularizing science. Together with Jacques Delabrouille, she wrote Les Nouveaux Messagers du Ciel, who was awarded the prize of the Astronomy Book of the Year in 2012. Recently, With her daughter Clara, she wrote a very nice letter to Marie Curie. She is also part of the organizing company of the Astronomy Festival in Florence, and we have the chance to meet almost every year there. Today, she will present her last results on the constraints that we can get on massive neutrinos and warm dark matter from the large scale structure, mostly using BAO and redshift space distortion from the BOSS spectroscopic survey from SDSS. Nathalie, in normal time, I would have said that the floor is yours, but today the only thing I can say is that the screens are yours. OK, je te laisse partager l'écran, euh, Nathalie. Nathalie, ouais, es voilà. ouais, est-ce est que c'est bon C'est bon, on t'entend. Ok, well, uh, <laughs> I want to thank uh, the virtual Jean-Philippe for this introduction and I thank uh, everybody at IAP who's uh, joining this uh, meeting here and in particular uh, Sandrine and uh, Johan for uh, inviting me. So the presentation that I'll give today is dedicated to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. I will uh, show first what this uh, project is and uh, in particular focusing on all the clustering information that it collected. And I'll present in the first part, some of the most recent results that have been achieved with this project. Then I'll focus more specifically on small scale clustering and by explaining what the Lyman Alpha survey of SDSS, the sub-survey dedicated to Lyman Alpha uh, from this uh, uh, SDSS project, uh, I will introduce it and explain how it can be used specifically to constrain properties of neutrinos, in particular their mass, and the nature of dark matter, and in particular focusing on warm dark matter. So starting with what SDSS is, it's a project that took data for many years, starting Uh, in terms of clustering or uh, cosmology surveys with the BOSS uh, project, which took data from 2009 to 2014, and which was, was immediately followed by the eBOSS project, which kept on taking data for the following six years until 2020. It's using a 2.5 meter telescope in New Mexico, of which you have an image here. And the goal of SDSS was to build a first uh, 3D map of all the structures in the universe, where uh, 
out of this 3D map, the two 2D coordinates came from the position of galaxies on the sky. And the third dimension, the redshift, was provided by the spectroscopic uh, focal plane of the instrument, which could take a spectra of 1,000 objects at the same time. And so with these uh, two sets of information, SDSS was able to build a, a beautiful 3D map of the universe. This illustrates the different sources that we focused on uh, with this project, starting with luminous red galaxies out to a redshift of about 0.7, and we had over a million of these objects. Then the EBOS, the second uh, part of uh, SDSS, added um, emission line galaxies, which are young galaxies, and quasars to probe the intermediate redshift range that was not studied initially by BOSS. And then in the most distant universe, we're studying clustering and the structures in the universe using the Lyman Alpha forest that can be observed in the spectra of very distant quasars. And we have a few hundred thousands of these quasars to study the Lyman Alpha forest, as you can see here. And I'll detail uh, later what specifically the Lyman Alpha forest is. Uh, BOSS and EBOSS were dedicated to the measurement of the baryon acoustic oscillation. So just a few words about what this is. Uh, BAOs or baryon acoustic oscillations arise from the propagation of the baryon photon over density waves in the early universe. These give rise to the well-known cosmic microwave background or CMB anisotropies, of which you have a, a tiny map here, but also to a preferred uh, scale in three dimension that can be observed in the distribution of galaxies. And uh, this uh, plot here illustrates what happens uh, at late times to a given initial of a density where you have both dark matter, baryons, photons, and neutrinos initially, but everything moves away. The baryons are carried away from the initial position of the, of the density because in the early universe, the baryons and the photons are just combined and in interacting in the initial um, plasma of the universe. But then at the, um, when the at a redshift of about 1,000, when the universe is 380,000 years old, the plasma just suddenly freezes. The universe becomes neutral. The photons just move away and give us this image of the cosmic microwave background. The baryons are stuck where the photons have carried them, and this gives rise to uh, an over density, a slight over density of baryons that have been carried over by the photons in, the, in this early uh, plasma. And so in the late time universe, around each initial over density, we have a slight excess of density of, uh, that were uh, produced by the baryons. And so we expect the galaxies to form where these over densities uh, reside. And this is why in the late map of galaxies in the universe, we expect to have this over density uh, surrounding any initial over density that was present in the early universe. However, we don't have a single overdensity in the universe. The universe is actually a superposition of tons of overdensities. And so instead of having a single uh, structure like the one I've described, we have so many structures that when we consider a single galaxy in the universe, it's just impossible to recover the BAO signal from just a, a random distribution of galaxy. The way to recover it is through statistical tools by statistically measuring the distance from any given uh, galaxy to all the other galaxies in the universe. And so this small animation uh, visualizes what the tool is doing. If you indeed measure the distance between any galaxy and all the other galaxies in the universe, and you look at the probability of these uh, uh, of this, of finding a given uh, separation of galaxies between um, uh, in, in your measurement, then you can recover the initial uh, structure that you had initially. And this is what was done for the first time in 2005, where you have the plot here that is the historical plot that first hinted at the existence of this over density. This is illustrating the two point correlation function. So the, the probability of finding two objects given a, a separation that is indicated here in the horizontal axis. This was the first hint. We had to wait for seven years to get a, a clear five sigma confirmation of the existence of this over density or BAO. But we now have a very precise measurement of this characteristic scale 
that uh, appears in the distribution of galaxies and which we can now measure with a precision of about 1%. Uh, by comparison, I'm showing you here this uh, characteristic scale normalized to the prediction that we have taking into account the cosmological parameters that have been measured by the Planck cosmic microwave background experiment as a function of redshift. So the gray, the black line here uh, is just showing the prediction from Planck. The gray band illustrates the uncertainty and all the different colored points here illustrate different measurements of this BAO scale at different redshifts. And you can see that currently all these measurements are in very good agreement with the prediction that we have from Planck. In BAO, however, we can now do beyond this average isotropic measurement, and we can actually infer information uh, on an anisotropic measurement. We can have both information uh, transverse to the line of sight, so across the line of sight, and this is just the angle that is sustained by this um, um, uh, preferred uh, scale uh, of the BAO scale. And this angle is, can, is related to cosmology through the angular diameter distance. But we also have an independent measurement, which is the one that we have along the line of sight, so a radial uh, measurement of this BAO scale, and which here is directly related to the Hubble expansion rate at the redshift at which we're doing this measurement. And these two uh, measurements are independent from one another, so they can really add information compared to what we were initially doing just with the isotropic measurement. Just to illustrate this, this uh, I'm showing you two plots here. On the left, you have the expansion of the universe as a function of redshift. So redshift increases to the right, which means that time flows to the left. And so here you can clearly see that the expansion of the universe was undergoing a deceleration during most of the history of the universe until redshift of about 0.7. And you can here now see the recent acceleration of the expansion uh, of the universe as measured with different BAO uh, probes. On the right, I'm illustrating uh, how the fact that we're covering a very large lever arm in redshift is very important to better constrain the parameters that we want to be measuring with BAO. And this illustrates the uh, dark energy density as a function of the dark matter density. And uh, the dark blue contours are just using the nearby galaxies when adding the new sets of galaxies in the uh, redshift trench between about 0.5 and 2, the emission line galaxies and the quasars, you see that we can already reduce the uncertainties in these two parameters. And when we uh, add in addition the information from the Lyman Alpha forest, we have a very uh, nice and significant detection of dark energy and uh, a precise measurement of the matter density in the universe independently from any other uh, information set. And in particular, this is an evidence, for instance, for the existence of dark energy and for spatial flatness independently of CMB. In addition to uh, baryon acoustic oscillation, uh, SDSS, so the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, is also measuring retrospace space distortion. So just in one word what this is, it's, uh, as I showed you, it's measuring a 3D map. So it's measuring the distribution of galaxies in three dimension in the universe. But galaxies tend to fall onto uh, over dense regions. And so if you imagine an initial spherical shell of over density around a given central region, these the galaxies tend to fall while the, the, the structures form uh, towards the, the central region which means that in addition to the cosmological redshift, which is measured through a velocity, you have the peculiar velocities of infall toward these overdense regions, which add up. And that means that if this is the shape that you would have in real space, a spherical distribution of galaxies, in redshift space, you have a flattening along the line of sight due to the contribution on top of the cosmological redshift of the peculiar velocities that uh, show this trend of falling towards the uh, central overdensities. And so this has now been observed very nicely. You have an example here of data taken by BOSS in 2016. 16, and you can clearly see the flattening towards uh, the central region. For a long time, this was considered as a nuisance, something that was destroying the BAO measurement that we were uh, 
uh, trying to measure. But it's also been realized later that this was actually carrying a lot of information because it does measure the velocities with which structures form. And this is directly related to uh, the, uh, the forces of gravity. And in particular, through this distortion parameter here, beta, you have a measurement of what is called structure growth, where uh, sigma eight uh, is the fluctuation amplitude and F related to the growth factor of structures and F is um, um, proportional to um, the matter density to a, a power that is the growth index uh, defined by your uh, gravity scenario. So you have a value of 0.55 if gravity follows the, the laws of general relativity, but you can have different values if you have to look for modified gravity. And so using this uh, distortion in redshift space, you actually have a probe of gravity on cosmological scales. And so some the, the, the typical results of uh, clustering are shown through these two plots, where on, as a function of redshift, you have in the top plot the expansion history of the universe. So the different ways to measure these distance, this characteristic scale in the universe. And the lines here are not fit to the data, but the predictions from Planck cosmology. So you can see that really this uh, measurement of cosmological uh, scale uh, BAO scale is in very good agreement uh, throughout all the redshift trends that has been probed so far with Planck prediction. And in the bottom, you have the comparison again of the prediction from Planck to uh, the growth uh, rate of, um, of structures that I've just defined uh, through RSD. And in this case, the uncertainties are still very large. This is really a measurement that has to be pursued in the next, uh, with the next generations of, uh, of uh, projects, but already show a very nice agreement, but we want really to tighten these error bars in order to be able to discriminate between general relativity and modified gravity. Uh, one last plot uh, that I want to show uh, concerning the recent results from the SDSS project is the following one. It's uh, related to the tension that uh, has uh, been discussed in the last uh, year or two on the Hubble uh, parameter H0, on the current value of the Hubble parameter H0. And I, I just want to illustrate here that clustering measurements can also bring uh, some very precise information uh, on, this, uh, on this question. So this plot illustrates the determination of H0 as a function of the matter density using um, information from load scales clustering but distinguishing the information that we can measure uh, on at low redshift, so redshifts below one, from that is shown here in red, from the, the information that we get uh, looking at high redshifts. And you can see that the degeneracy uh, between H0 and omega m are very different when you look at low redshift universe at or, or at the high redshift universe. In both cases, the the uh, characteristic BAO scale is calibrated not with the cosmic microwave background, but with information coming from the Big Bang nuclear synthesis. So uh, it's a measurement that is completely independent from what is done in CMB. And the combined information using all the SDSS measurements at low and high redshift is shown here in blue. And this gives a very tight um, measurement of H0 in very good agreement with the CMB uh, measurements and obtained in a completely independent uh, manner with completely independent data sets. So this is a very nice uh, confirmation of the value of H0 obtained from uh, measurements in the early universe. Here, the calibration is using Big Bang nuclear synthesis that occurs when the universe is just a few minutes old. And this is this gives an H0 value um, in agreement with uh, the one determined by Planck. So enough about what SDSS uh, recently showed. And let me now focus on small scale clustering. So here I was talking about the large scale clustering and now I wanted to focus on what happens on small scales. On small scales, this is where we can really measure the gravitational potentials on small scales. And these are affected by the light particles 
that uh, carry mass, but that do not cluster as the cold dark matter particles would. And in particular, one example of such light particles are neutrinos. They're relativistic because they have very tiny masses during most of the history of the universe. And which means that instead of clustering in the gravitational potentials as ordinary uh, cold dark matter or ordinary matter would, they just uh, free streams, they stream away from these gravitational potentials, which means that they not only reduce these uh, potential wells, but they also slow um, slow down their growth. And this can be measured in hydrodynamical simulations. Uh, and we, we see that this suppression depends on the mass of the particles. And so by measuring the suppression of uh, clustering growth, we can actually constrain the mass of such particles. The tool that we use to measure this is clustering. So I've talked so far about the correlation function, which is just the probability of finding two objects separated by a given distance. We can also take that same information in Fourier space, in which case uh, the, the measurement is shown as a power spectrum, here shown, here illustrated for the total matter power spectrum. So um, the horizontal axis here is scale. Since we're in Fourier space, it means that large scales are on the left, small scales on the right, and the, the, the abscess that I'm showing here is just the wave number k inversely proportional to the scale. So remember that all the power spectra will always have the large scales on the left and the small scales on the right. The different colored points here illustrate the measurement of this power spectrum with many different uh, probes, cosmological probes, uh, going from uh, cosmic microwave background, temperature and polarization measurements on the larger scales to uh, large scale structure measurements, typically with galaxies on the intermediate regime. And in the smallest scales, this is the information that we can have with uh, the Lyman Alpha surveys that I'll describe so shortly. And so I've mentioned that uh, neutrinos and other light particles will suppress the matter power spectrum on small scales. And so this is illustrating the suppression that we expect to be observing. And as you can see, it's a very tiny effect. So to see that effect better, it's not on the absolute matter power spectrum that we can uh, discuss it, but rather by looking at the ratio of the power spectrum in the presence of these massive but very light particles to the power spectrum that we have in, if these particles were massless and just not, uh, not carrying any mass um, information. And so this ratio here clearly illustrates the suppression. This is the level that we would have in the absence of suppression. And you see here that for neutrinos of 0.5 electron volt or one electron volt, you have a significant suppression that also slightly depends on the redshift at which you're measuring this suppression. And so I've, I'm again showing the different probes of the uh, structure clustering that we can have in the universe. And you can see that the Lyman Alpha Forest is ideally suited to measure the suppression because it's located where the suppression is maximum and is also having a, a very nice uh, sensitivity on the redshift because it covers a very large uh, redshift range. The issue, however, with the Lyman Alpha uh, survey is that it's occurring in the nonlinear regime. So where all the nonlinearities in the universe will, will affect your signal. And also it's a measurement of flux as we'll see and not directly of matter. So to actually be able to compare your results to cosmological predictions, you have to um, refer to hydrodynamical simulations which complicate the analysis quite significantly. Just to illustrate in uh, one uh, short movie, the clustering of matter for the different uh, components that we're considering in these uh, simulations. So um, when I run this movie, you'll see on the top left, the, the, the clustering in the gas components, so the baryons, the ones we can actually measure. In red, the clustering that occurs on the dark matter, which is the uh, component that carries all the mass. In yellow, the clustering in neutrinos, so a tiny fraction of the mass, but is the one that's, uh, that we want to be uh, constraining. And here you'll see appearing the stars, uh, which are very uh, simply modeled in these simulations because uh, we just uh, don't use the stars in our measurements. They occur on, on uh, scales that are even smaller than the ones we're interested in. 
And so you can see here the simulation starting at redshift of 15 when all distributions in uh, all different components were completely homogeneous. And then as the redshift evolves to today, uh, you can see the clustering uh, occurring in the different components. And uh, what's interesting is to notice, for instance, that the clustering in the gas component, which is the one we want to measure, is uh, very similar to the clustering we can observe in the dark matter, which is the one we want to infer. So by measuring gas, you uh, really have a very good proxy of what happens in dark matter. Notice also in neutrinos that there's very little clustering, and this is what I was saying initially. The neutrinos stream away, they are so uh, light that they remain relativistic for most of the history of the universe, and they barely cluster at all. In the densest regions, you see, however, a, a, a small clustering that is similar to what you have in dark matter or in gas. So let us now see what the, the how we do this uh, cluster, how we do these clustering measurements on small scales. And let me introduce the Lyman alpha component of the SDSS survey. Lyman alpha is not uh, what we observe directly. What we observe are very distant quasars. We choose these objects because quasars are among the brightest objects that we can have in the universe. And so being so bright, they're visible to very high redshift and typically out to redshift of about five, which is what we're using in SDSS. Um, the light from the quasar is absorbed along its uh, way to us by the clouds of neutral hydrogen uh, in the intergalactic medium. And uh, these absorptions are uh, what will be used as a proxy for the dark matter. This is what I illustrated with the animation just before. By uh, measuring the absorptions that we have in the light of these distant quasars, we can actually measure the contribution and the density of neutral hydrogen along the line of sight. And so uh, this is then what is used to produce the, the power spectrum in Lyman alpha absorption, or in other words, in neutral hydrogen density along the line of sight. This uh, plot on the right will illustrate uh, the, the, um, the measurement that we actually have. This is the spectrum of a distant quasar without any absorption along the line of sight. And when I'll run this animation, you will see happening the absorptions uh, due, by, uh, due to neutral hydrogen. So you have this peak here, which is uh, the Lyman alpha emission of neutral hydrogen. And uh, blue words of this peak, you will have the, um, the absorption caused by the uh, intervening hydrogen clouds along the line of sight. When the hydrogen clouds are very dense, like here, you can even see saturated absorptions that occur uh, just due to the very high column density of neutral hydrogen. And so the, the measurement that we're actually interested in is this part of the quasar spectrum, which is what we call the Lyman alpha forest. Here you have two different real spectra uh, of distant quasars. The top one is in the nearby universe where you see very little absorptions. And this is because the nearby universe is basically entirely ionized. So you have very little neutral hydrogen and therefore very little absorptions. Whereas in the distant universe, the universe is still highly uh, neutral or sufficiently neutral that we can have a sufficient amount of neutral hydrogen to produce this very dense Lyman alpha forest here. And so what we do, we measure the transmitted flux fraction of which we compute the Fourier uh, transform square it basically, and you obtain the 1D power spectrum, 1D because that's along the line of sight to the quasar. And so this is the measurement that we actually produce in the end, 1D power spectrum of this uh, neutral hydrogen contribution for different bands and redshifts. And so you can see here that there's also information not only as a function of scale, so again, large scales on the left, small scales on the right, but also as a function of redshift. And uh, this will be uh, important to, to determine the constraints that we're interested in. So now going to the constraints and starting with the information that we get on neutrino masses. So what do we know about neutrinos? From particle physics and from observations of neutrino oscillations, we know that neutrinos are massive then not massless like uh, had been considered for, uh, for quite many years. We know they have masses and these neutrino oscillation experiments can measure the difference in mass squared between two uh, neutrino species. 
we also have a direct constraint on the mass of the lightest neutrino from tritium beta decay, which has recently been upgraded to an upper bound of about one electron volt by the Katrin uh, experiment. And so uh, combined, these two sets of information tell us that the sum of the three of the masses of the three uh, active neutrino species is um, constrained to be between 0.06 electron volts at the lightest and three electron volts if all three uh, neutrinos had the same mass of about one electron volt. But this doesn't tell us uh, the um, the actual individual masses of each of the neutrino species, because neutrino oscillations only constrain uh, the differences in mass squared. And so we can have two different orderings of the neutrino masses. The one we call normal ordering, where you have two very light neutrinos, uh, where the difference in mass is constrained by the information from solar uh, oscillations. And one heavier neutrino, where the difference in mass here is the one that is constrained by the atmospheric oscillations or you can have two heavy neutrinos and one light one. And according to the scenario you consider, the minimal mass value of the, the three neutrino masses is either of 0.06 electron volt, which is the lower bound here, or 0.1 electron volt, which is uh, in between. Now, cosmology can really help because neutrinos are very abundant in the universe. They're almost as abundant as uh, photons. And uh, even with a tiny mass of the order of about 0.1 electron volt, the total mass in neutrinos is comparable to the total mass in stars. So neutrinos are very abundant in the universe and they can therefore affect uh, the cosmological observations. Now, what cosmology measures is only the sum of the neutrino masses. It's not the individual masses. And this was shown in the following uh, two sets of uh, tests. On the left uh, plot, you have the um, power spectrum, uh, the 3D uh, matter power spectrum uh, in the measured with uh, typical Boltzmann codes. Uh, compared to uh, the total power spectrum that you expect for the case where all three neutrino masses would be identical. That's the case that I call the generate. Then the blue and red curves illustrate the, the ratio of the power spectrum in these two uh, configurations compared to the dead generate case. Normal is for the normal ordering that I had before with two light and one heavy neutrino. Inverted is for the, the second case, well, I'm showing here, with one light and two heavy neutrinos. And what you can see is the difference in the total uh, power spectrum is only of the order of at most uh, three per mil. So less than a percent difference in the total matter power spectrum. And as you go to what you can actually measure, which is the one dimensional flux power spectrum in baryons, the difference between uh, these uh, three uh, scenarios is even smaller. Uh, you can see here that the difference is much smaller than the uh, uncertainty that you have in your prediction from the, cosm the, the hydro simulations that you're using. So there is no doubt that in cosmology, uh, we cannot currently distinguish the masses of the individual neutrinos, not even um, the, the ordering of these neutrinos, what we have is exclusively a measurement of the sum of the neutrino masses. So we can actually, that means that we could distinguish between these two orderings if the constraint becomes tighter than the minimal mass between these two uh, orderings. Since I've showed you here that for the inverted scenarios, for instance, the minimal mass is at least of 0.1 electron volt. So if the bound that you obtain is smaller than that, then you know that you have to go for a normal ordering. So what are these bounds? Um, Planck, so the measurement of the cosmic microwave background can already produce by itself a constraint on neutrino masses. And uh, the most recent upper bound is the following, using Planck data alone and only focusing on the load scale. So not taking into account the, what happens in the late time universe. And the constraint given by Planck is at the level of 0.5 uh, electron volts. The Lyman alpha forest alone, so the, this uh, one dimensional power spectrum that I've shown you can also constrain the sum of the neutrino masses uh, because that's uh, measuring the regime where the suppression due to neutrino contribution is the strongest at the level of about 0.7 electron volts. However, what is most important and most interesting is to combine these two sets of measurements because 
Planck has little sensitivity by itself to neutrino masses because it's mostly probing the regime where the power spectrum is unaffected by these uh, free streaming particles. Lyman alpha forest is probing the regime where the suppression is maximum, but on the other hand, by itself, it's, it doesn't have a comparison point and so can only constrain neutrino mass through the small scale dependence that you have of this redshift suppression. So the tightest information will come when you can combine the information on small scales with that on the large scales. And this is what has been done in this uh, analysis here, where you have in red the constraint from Lyman alpha alone, in blue the constraint from CMB data alone, and in red and green the constraint when you combine the two sets of measurements, which significantly tightened the upper bound that you can have um, on the sum of the neutrino masses. And here in yellow, when uh, further adding information from uh, BAU clustering and from the lensing of the cosmic microwave background. And so this is really the tightest bound that you can have on the sum of the neutrino masses. It's obtained from cosmology and uh, is very complementary to what particle physics can do. Um, now, the last part of my uh, talk is to show what we can also infer uh, from uh, the study of small scale clustering from SDSS on the nature of dark matter. I've talked so far about uh, the active neutrinos, so the three neutrino species, the uh, electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino, which have very tiny masses. But we, uh, these neutrinos are only right uh, left-handed particles, and we consider that uh, it's uh, quite possible that there should exist a right-handed component to these uh, left-handed uh, particles. And so a minimal extension to the standard model of particle physics is the new MSM, where you have a whole set of sterile neutrinos that should exist to, uh, uh, to parallel the uh, existing uh, and known uh, active neutrinos. And in the sterile neutrino sector, one of the uh, plausible scenarios is to consider that you have two very heavy neutrinos in the GV mass scale uh, that would be responsible for baryogenesis, for instance. And the mass scale of the third neutrino is not constrained in this model. But if it's in the KV uh, mass scale, then it could be an excellent candidate for dark matter. We could have all the dark matter in the form of such a KV um, sterile neutrino, and this could actually alleviate some of the uh, issues that we have with cold dark matter scenarios. A further motivation for a KV uh, sterile neutrino is uh, the observations that have been uh, done in the past few years on several clusters of galaxies or on the Andromeda galaxy, uh, where the X-ray measurements on these um, clusters and galaxies show an excess around 3.5 kilo electron volts that cannot be explained neither through astrophysical backgrounds or instrumental effects. And so this effect uh, could be uh, the signature of the decay of a 7 kV sterile neutrinos into an active neutrino and a photon, and the 3.5 kV photon being what is causing the excess that is observed in, uh, uh, in these uh, X-ray measurements. So this is a further motivation uh, for uh, a few kV uh, sterile neutrino. So how can we constrain it using cosmology? where I've shown you how we can constrain the mass of active neutrinos by looking at the ratio of the power spectrum and the comparison of the power spectrum that we obtain on small scales to what is, a, to what is predicted on, on large scales. So the unsuppressed power spectrum as measured by the cosmic microwave background. And uh, because the, the higher the neutrino mass, the more we take away from the total uh, mass and in, uh, in matter in the universe, um, it means that the higher the neutrino mass, the, the stronger the suppression you have in this uh, power spectrum. So this means that what we measured for neutrino, active neutrinos is an upper limit on the mass of these active neutrinos. For warm dark matter or sterile neutrino, the scenario is a little bit different. What we consider is that we want to replace all the dark matter by these sterile neutrinos. So here, uh, we did not play in addition with the mass of the active neutrinos. We just took that for a fixed value. And what we want to be testing is whether all the dark matter could be in the form of, the, of such a KV uh, mass particles. So here, 
uh, the the lighter the mass of the particle, the sooner the, the suppression occurs. And so it means that uh, the, the constraint that we will have will be a lower limit on the mass of the warm dark matter particle. So this is illustrating again the ratio of the power spectrum to what would be predicted for cold dark matter particle as a function of a uh, wave number k, so large scales here, small scales here. Now, taking this uh, prediction for the matter power spectrum, we then run hydrodynamical simulations uh, using these as the uh, input. And this are, these are uh, showing the predictions that we have for the Lyman alpha flux power spectrum. And uh, we then compare these predictions to data uh, to see what constraints we can set. And so what you have to notice here is that there are two regimes where uh, the, the, the data is most important. It's on very small scale, so the high K bands here, because uh, on small scale is where you have the strongest suppression, once again, so the small scales carry a lot of information, but also the high redshift, because as you go to higher redshift, you're closer to the linear regime, so you're less affected by all the non-linearities that occur uh, during the history of structure formation. And so as you go to higher redshifts, you also have a stronger suppression, whereas you go to lower and lower redshift, uh, the, the non-linearity is actually dilute your signal very significantly. And so what are the results that uh, have been achieved with uh, these, uh, these studies? Uh, they're summarized in this plot here, in this table here. Uh, the column in um, yellow illustrate that we can have, uh, we have put a lower bound on the mass of a thermal relic at the level of about five kilo electron volts. And this could be uh, translated into a lower bound on the mass of a sterile neutrino uh, for a simple scenario of what is called uh, non resonantly produced sterile neutrinos at the level of 34 uh, kilo electron volts. So you see that this is in uh, complete disagreement with the possibility of explaining the uh, X-ray uh, signal at 3.5 kV in the form of a 7 kV sterile neutrinos. This is excluding this possibility here. However, uh, I won't go into the details, but we can also consider more general scenarios for sterile neutrinos, and that's called uh, what um, the recently produced sterile neutrinos, and uh, these would occur in the case where the early universe would have some lepton asymmetry, which could enhance the neutrino oscillations. And by enhancing these oscillations, we can actually have uh, a component of, um, of sterile neutrinos with much lower momenta and such much, and therefore much colder uh, dark matter since the particles would not move as, uh, as uh, fast. And uh, by having this cold uh, component of the sterile neutrinos, we can actually uh, be in better agreement with the data. And uh, the bounds are summarized here. So uh, you'll have the, the graph if you want to spend more time on it. But this is uh, the constraints that have been obtained in the context of resonantly produced sterile neutrinos. So with this uh, much more general uh, formation scenario of sterile neutrinos shown as a function of mass here. The black uh, point is the 7 kV interpretation of the cluster uh, data in X-ray. Uh, the vertical axis is for the different mixing angles that we can have for these gel neutrinos with the active um, uh, neutrino species. And the colored regions are the ones that are excluded. In blue, using uh, SDSS information alone. In red, when adding in addition information on smaller scales from different data set that provides information to small scales. And as I said, going to small scales increases the, the sensitivity of the measurement. So we can exclude a larger region of the data space. And you can see that the 7 kV cell neutrino here is uh, in tension with these tightest uh, measurements, although not excluded yet using uh, both data only. So um, this is a, a pretty extensive uh, summary of uh, the different searches that have been led uh, through uh, the past uh, 10 or 20 years with SDSS and focusing in particular on the small scales for uh, constraints on uh, neutrino masses and nature of dark matter. So what's coming up next? As DSS, as I told you, has finished taking data. However, that's the new project that is now uh, just about, well, just starting to take data. It's the DESI uh, project, which stands for Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. 
in, in one word, what DESI is, it's a scale up of BOSS with a massively parallel fiber fed spectrograph. So it's using the four meter uh, mile telescope in Arizona at Kid Peak that has been entirely refurbished. We changed the corrector to increase the field of view. Uh, we also changed the focal plane, which is now equipped with the fiber positioners. And all the light goes down through optical fibers to a set of 10 uh, spectrographs. I'll just show you one uh, or two slides on DESI. I just want to um, uh, highlight here the fact that uh, it's covering a much larger area of the sky than SDSS did. So we uh, went from uh, uh, 7,000 square degrees for EBOS, 10,000 square degrees for BOSS to 14,000 square degrees for DESI. And basically 14,000 square degrees is a third of the celestial sky, but it's mostly every part of the sky that can be observed from the ground, uh, avoiding the galaxy. So it's, uh, there's not much more to the extragalactic sky than these 14,000 square degrees as can be observed from the ground. And it's a pretty large uh, collaboration. It covers uh, 600 members from 74 institutions, over half of them being uh, non-US. So here's just one slide on the spectrographs. This is one of the main uh, contributions from uh, France to this instrument. Uh, we have 10 three-channel spectrographs, and this is one of these uh, spectrographs with the three channels illustrated here. Why three channels? Uh, because we want to cover a very large wavelength uh, band from uh, the near UV here uh, to go down in the measurement of the Lyman Alpha Forest to about a redshift of two, to the near infrared here, because for the young emission line galaxies, we want to go all the way up to very high redshifts of about uh, 1.6. This is one of the first uh, spectra that has been measured uh, with DESI. And here is the uh, O2 uh, doublet that is uh, the, the signature of these emission line galaxies. In terms of focal plane, there's a great improvement also compared to what we had with SDSS. In SDSS, the focal plane was equipped with uh, aluminum plates in which we had to drill the holes at the position of the targets that we would have to observe. And during the daytime, we would manually plug the 1000 fibers in, into each of those holes. The plugging itself took about an hour, but drilling the plates and defining all these, well, these uh, plates and, and holes would have to be uh, meant that we basically had to plan the observations a few months ahead of time. In contrast, in DESI, we have 5,000 uh, robotic fiber positioners, so we can take five times as many uh, spectra at the same time. But also, all these fibers are located uh, with these, um, these robots, and uh, so we can just define a new exposure uh, in within one minute or so, reposition all 5,000 uh, robots at the position where we want to be observing. So uh, from we, we went from several months of planning to a few minutes of planning before uh, having to before being able to take the data. And the focal plane is finished. So this is an image of the full focal plane with all the pedals. And uh, this is a, a view of this focal plane taken from in front of it, uh, where we can see all the fibers uh, back illuminated. Uh, this illustrates the coverage uh, in terms of redshift that we'll have with DESI. So basically it's using a very similar distribution of tracers, but with much uh, denser densities. And so in total, we'll expect to have about 35 million redshifts with DESI. So 20 times as many as what we had in SDSS. And how would that be used to improve our constraints on neutrino bounds, for instance? We'll, we'll have about uh, a, a sample of at least 700 uh, high redshift quasars, so quasars in which we'll be able to measure the Lyman Alpha Forest. So that's about five to six times as many as what we had in uh, SDSS. And so we'll have much better statistics and also go to higher redshifts. Uh, in addition, the instrument has a higher resolution than we had in SDSS. I'm just giving you here some indication of these uh, resolutions in terms of lambda over de delta lambda. So that's about a factor of 1.5 to 2 better than we had. And that means that we can also access uh, smaller scales than we could before. And so uh, in terms of bounds on neutrino masses, this is a summary of what we expect to be achieving. 
The 0.56 is what I showed for a plank. And uh, these are the improvements that we expect to be achieving with DESI uh, to reach, to achieve in the end, hopefully, um, uh, an uncertainty on the sum of the neutrino masses of about 20 milli electron volts, which means that even in the case of no more hierarchy, we should have uh, a measurement and not just uh, an upper bound on the neutron masses at the level of about three sigma. So in conclusions, I remind you here are the, the bounds that we have, oops, this should have been a three with the recent uh, results from Katrin, the bounds that we have from particle physics. And as I showed you, uh, lyman alpha is a very powerful tool in cosmology that can really uh, help determining uh, the measurement of, well, determining the mass of the active neutrinos or constraining the nature of dark matter. I've just talked about thermal relics or stellar neutrinos, but other types of dark matter can be uh, studied also in a similar manner. And with the upcoming uh, DESI experiment, which is currently uh, validating the survey, but uh, will take, uh, will start the main survey very shortly, we can expect to have finally a first uh, measurement from cosmology of the neutrino masses uh, and not just an upper bound, as well as uh, additional, uh, a lot more additional uh, results on cosmology, neutrino masses, uh, warm dark matter and uh, cosmology in general. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions if you have. Merci beaucoup, Nathalie. J'ai une question. Euh, bah Vas-y, Norma, tu peux commencer si tu veux. Euh, bonjour. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nathalie. Um, uh, the first uh, point. Um, is uh, um, uh, you have uh, um, two, um, two high uh, lower bounds for um, thermal relics or uh, sterile neutrinos uh, for uh, dark matter. Uh, these, uh, uh, these bounds, in fact, uh, um, are, uh, can be lowered and um, in, um, and uh, uh, these uh, lower bounds agree um, with other constraints, which are very important, a very uh, much more higher redshift, and um, also independently with uh, uh, constraints from uh, local um, structures, uh, dwarf uh, galaxies, from very well established uh, observations and all that agree uh, by saying a lower bound, bound uh, for the relics. Um, um, so the mass um, larger than two, uh, about two kilo electron volt say. So the windows uh, today with very, well-established observations and simulations, taking into account the different groups in the world working on that, is that uh, it could be um, for the relics a world are matter, the mass between uh, two and four electro, kilo electron volts, which should put uh, for the sterile neutrinos about uh, uh, set uh, five and 10 kilo electron volts. Thank you. And this is, uh, this is, um, uh, this is um, an a point to uh, these bounds uh, you have, I mean, the last uh, you have, because previously you, you had lower bounds for, for the, in fact, for the sterile neutrino. So this is a point and uh, uh, I would like to have your comment because I have my ideas and people have the idea why you are obtaining two, 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 two high uh, lower bounds, uh, bounds now. Thank you. So this is um, the bound that we had before, which are uh, slightly less tight, but not very different to, from what the ones I showed uh, now. Um, here, uh, I'm showing this table here because I have one more column. So the central column is comparable to the, the most uh, recent bounds that uh, we want to publish using all uh, redshift uh, um, uh, 
power spectra. However, if we remove, oh, but this I had the same actually. So let me show the, the most recent balance for this anyway. Here, uh, if we compare the right column, which is the, the tightest bound to the left column, we just remove the two highest redshift bands, uh, which are the one at redshift 4.3 and 4.5. And why remove them? It's because uh, they are the ones that carry the less statistical information. The density of quasars uh, evolves with redshift. We have many more quasars around redshift two than we have around redshift four. And so uh, this actually uh, shows very well in the error bars that we have. We have very tiny error bars at low redshift. We have much more, uh, much larger error bars of, at high redshift. Uh, however, we see that indeed uh, the bounds uh, strengthen significantly if we use the high redshift ones, uh, which means that even though uh, the statistical power is small in these high redshift bands, uh, as I was explaining before, they carry a lot of uh, constraining power. Now, uh, the bounds also uh, improved by adding the information on uh, the smallest scales, which is here brought by the XQ100 uh, experiment, which I haven't uh, presented, but which is a specific uh, program dedicated to measuring the pi spectrum from a very small sample of 100 spectra, 100 quasars. Here we have a uh, about 180 quasars from which we selected 40,000 of them, which were the ones with the best uh, measurements. Here it's only 100 uh, quasars, but at um, with that were measured with an instrument that allows going to much smaller scales. And so uh, this also contributes to improving uh, and tightening the limit. Now, uh, what I want to show is the, what we had before. So this is the, the other plot that I was showing. So again, you have a comparison of uh, removing the highest stretch of bins or removing, which we didn't do in the latest study, removing the information from these uh, smallest scales. These uh, smallest scales do tighten the limit indeed. Uh, and I'm here showing the results by two different groups. Um, the uh, subscript one is uh, our group. The subscript two is a group uh, um, from Matteo Viel and uh, one of his students, uh, Viderzic. Uh, the bounds we obtain are similar. Uh, they get a slightly tighter bounds because they have. Uh, they were also able to uh, use the information from higher redshifts, which uh, we could not analyze at the time. But we see that uh, the two groups obtain very similar results, and indeed, uh, that as we use higher redshifts or smaller scales, we tighten the results as uh, predicted by the thermal um, hydrodynamical simulations. However, these are not always uh, considered, um, well, these have to, these results using the small scales have to be considered with uh, a lot of care indeed, because they're more prone to systematics. And in particular, they have some, they, they include some degeneracies with the thermal history of the intergalactic medium. And uh, so uh, they have to be taken with care. But the impact, however, is not at the level of uh, reducing these bounds by a factor of two. And so uh, that's indeed uh, a situation that we had in the Lyman Alpha Forest for quite a while, where we see that the bounds we obtain are tighter than uh, other bounds from uh, different uh, experiments. But uh, we see here the completely independent analysis by different groups, and they all provide the, the same, uh, same set of results. Thank you. Just briefly to uh, to uh, to um, reply to that, I see very well uh, all the analysis, observations, and the samples uh, redshift uh, the beans. But um, uh, here the point, as you said, uh, also known for the Lyman forest, is the contamination with intergalactic thermal effects which cannot which are not the thermal effect of the, of their matter and the pressure effects and all that making the simulations uncertainties and that is the the difference between uh, the the range in the in the kilo electron volt the different groups find so as you said the vl another uh, and another group obtain these bounds but other groups uh, as you know, or I mean, there are published, obtained, and in particular, the recent one from Lawrence and uh, Bohr's uh, institutes, which obtained um, lower, I mean, about two kilo electron volts, which, by the way, agrees 
perfectly with the bounds obtained from the local uh, uh, world that, um, worth galaxies and the uh, very robust um, Hubble uh, Space Telescope uh, Deep Frontier Fields, all the series of papers um, published, uh, I mean, recently uh, in, in um, in astrophysical journal and in other, so there is that uh, a work to do for the um, uh, improvement in the simulation on the thermal ester history rhinoization and the intergalactic me medium astrophysical effects, which are plugging uh, here the effects. So yeah, I agree uh, that I, there's. I see there's a lot of work that is being done on this field, and uh, and I think that's uh, very interesting. And uh, it does cover indeed uh, a lot of expertise uh, on the thermal history, and uh, this is something that will be pursued in the in the next years uh, to solve that uh, that tension. There's no doubt. Thank you very much, Nathalie. Uh, are there other questions from other people? You can raise your Gary. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you, Nathalie, for your beautiful talk. I learned a lot. And uh, what a career you have since we skied together. I forget at which Mario meeting in the 90s. So congratulations. So I have just a very technical point um, about uh, DESI. So DESI is going to do para uh, parallel fibering. So I was wondering whether they will have a worse fiber collision issue than SDSS. Uh, and if so, uh, Will it be a problem or not? Because uh, you will lack maybe some small scale uh, um, measures for the transverse effects, but you still have the, the radial effects, as you call it, the line of sight effects. So I guess it's not a problem. I just want to hear your confirmation. So uh, this is a very interesting point. Uh, the fiber collision effect is very different in DESI than it was in SDSS, because here the fibers actually have a patrol radius that's predefined. Uh, each fiber can only be moved within a given radius, uh, which we've made sure overlaps with the radius that can be covered by the neighboring fiber. So uh, there's no hole in our focal plane. Uh, however, two uh, fibers, we don't want them to collide when we position them. So what uh, we have to do, and that's uh, actually one of the, the tasks of this uh, survey validation uh, period, is to check that uh, we are indeed able to position all the fibers without making them collide. And what we'll do to avoid and to reduce the uh, the um, the, the, the issues related to not being able to cover the focal plane as densely as we would like, given these limited uh, patrol radius of the fibers, is to have several passes uh, over a given region of the sky. And actually with DESI, we'll have up to five passes so that each region of the sky will be covered five times. And that will allow us to go to much smaller um, uh, distance between two fibers than uh, what uh, would be technically possible with a given pass uh, alone. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Other questions for Nathalie? Okay, if not, maybe I can ask one. Um, so, so I guess when you talked about uh, neutrinos and warm, ma warm dark matter um, constraints, it was um, using power spectra. Uh, what about uh, other um, uh, probes that, that you can have? Uh, can they add information on the neutrino mass, for instance? And, uh... Uh, yes, absolutely. So I've only focused on the Lyman Alpha Forest, and all my talk was uh, presenting what Lyman Alpha Forest can bring. But here in the predictions, in the forecast that we have in, with DESI, we actually include information also from galaxy clustering. So here, not the Lyman Alpha Forest, but on the uh, intermediate scales from galaxy clustering. And you can see that uh, the the level of uncertainty that we expect to be reaching is comparable to the one of the Lyman Alpha Forest, even slightly better. And uh, that will be very interesting because it's probing a different regime. The systematics are different. Uh, here, uh, the systematics really lies in the modeling of the nonlinear uh, clustering in galaxy range. Uh, this is very different from what we have in the Lyman Alpha Forest. It's not at all the same densities in terms of the matter distribution. 
and the analysis are very different also. So uh, we'll have a cross check of the measurements by using the different probes and we can also combine them and this is where we'll have the, the tightest um, bound. These uh, forecasts are using uh, two-point statistics uh, only, and uh, we are currently working also on an approach using bispectrum information, for instance, so using a, a three-point statistics, and uh, this can significantly improve the, uh, the measurement by breaking all the degeneracies, and uh, we can expect, but this is still under development, uh, an improvement of about a factor of four on these bounds uh, using bispectrum information information, for instance. Thank you. And um, if you were to do such an analysis with uh, including primordial non gaussianities uh, would you have some degeneracies with, say, neutrino massive, or how does it uh, um, line up together? So, um, it's assumed to be zero, no primordial non gaussianities Absolutely, absolutely. So, so far, we're decorrelating the, the problems. <laughs> if, if... Yeah. If to mention that these are problems, uh, non uh, Gaussianities would occur mostly on the larger scales. Uh, so I would assume that the problems are indeed decorrelated between neutrino masses and non Gaussianities. Uh, these are still, uh, most of the information comes from the smaller scales, whereas for non-Gaussianities, uh, we would be instead going to the larger scales. So the, the, um, I think the information would be largely decorrelated and they would not impact one another. Uh, however, non-Gaussianities is a different story that's really going to be complicated too, because that's very sensitive to uh, the uh, imaging from which we're selecting our targets, because that's using the larger scales. And so we want a very homogeneous imaging over the entire footprint to make sure that we don't induce uh, non-Gaussianities just by uh, inhomogeneities in our footprint. Okay. And maybe also, um, I guess, the redshift evolution of the suppression of power is probably different between the two. Um, this is not something I have looked into, but uh, I would assume so, yes. Uh, Norma, you have another question? Yes, it's about, uh, it's not about uh, um, dark matter or bounds. It's about the first part of the talk, which is also, which uh, I found uh, I found that interesting because about the the VAO and uh, and the bounds uh, and the constraints you presented, omega matter H zero. I should say that that uh, um, is uh, is by now uh, 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 understood or accepted uh, that um, is um, the tension uh, on, on these constraints uh, on H zero, uh, for instance, um, are irrespective of the of the CMB or of the type of measurement measurement in the early universe. All the all the the different BBN, uh, um, BAO, uh, CMB, whatever Planck, or uh, even the last analysis. Uh, of of map uh, nine year may recently with polarization and so on agree uh, in the lower uh, um, uh, value of h zero the lower set the as you know um, that uh, that uh, does not mean that uh, the value of h zero is that I mean uh, uh, it does uh, mean that there is a detention. In fact, because H0 is indirectly uh, obtained here, while uh, Adam, uh, I mean, uh, Rees and others obtained directly in the, in, the, in the present universe H0. So the, the tension could be um, expressed now in terms of the, uh, not of H0, but in terms of the um, uh, sound horizon. The tension is, in fact, on the sound horizon, which became an ancho or the, uh, for the uh, early, uh, early uh, universe measurements. And so uh, um, tension could be placed in terms of the sound horizon. So I think you obtain here a, a sound horizon. I mean, the values are not put, but you could uh, place the values of, of the sign horizon and compare with the other measurements. And, and you will see that it's 
such that. I, I don't know, I mean, no, no, <laughs> nobody understands why is that, but uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is the situation. So I, I completely agree with what you said. Actually, I have a slide here which illustrates how we get a constraint on each knot uh, using BAO. BAO by itself does not measure each knot because it measures uh, angles or delta theta or delta z through the BAO information. Yeah. Yeah. And these are related to the sun horizon through cosmological parameters. And so we get the H information uh, from the delta z, but we also get an integral over each uh, through uh, the angular diameter distance. So what Absolutely. we require uh, in BIO is indeed a calibration of the sound horizon, which can be provided by CMB or by BBM. And so uh, this is why we can provide some constraint independently of CMB because we can calibrate on BBM. And the calibration gives us the normalization here of what we measure. And yes. that provides in the end a, a determination of H naught. And so, as I said, indeed, uh, and that uh, completely agrees with what you said. BAO plus Big Bang nuclear synthesis provides uh, an independent measurement of H0 from the early universe. So from the information of the sun horizon calibrated in the early universe. So that just confirms the tension that we have in uh, early universe uh, constraints, whether from B uh, CMB or BIO plus BBN with the uh, independent measurements in the local universe from supernovae, yeah. from uh, tip of the ray giant branch, etc. So we do yeah. have two independent and uh, uh, measurements that are in tension okay. that could be on H naught, but it, identically it could be on the sun horizon. Uh, we get a smaller it's, sun horizon. So is the calibration. Is the I completely cali agree are, with what you said. We are, uh, which answer you you take for the calibration? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, no, but that's that's a very interesting tension. It means that the the absolutely. extrapolation the extrapolation from the early universe to today doesn't work currently. And so we have to understand if we have to solve an issue in this extrapolation, which could come from uh, a non-standard evolution of dark energy, for instance, or if we have to find, but that becomes less and less uh, uh, understandable systematics in all the local measurements. So uh, yeah, that's a, an interesting issue, but I, that was not the focus of my talk, so I didn't want to spend no, more no, time on it. No, but I wanted, I mean, it was the first part, I think it's, it, it was, interesting to to point out okay thank you very much uh, if there is no more question i think we can stop here so